This document is called the Nucleophilicity versus Basicity Chart and you can find a copy of this in D2L and you might want to print out your own copy because I don't think you can necessarily read all the details here on this video but I wanted to explain the importance of this document. In this chapter we're studying nucleophiles and how well something can function in that regard to engage in a substitution reaction. But substitution reactions rarely go to 100% completion. You always get unexpected side products. And one of the main competing reactions with something behaving as a nucleophile is for it to behave like a base. <clears throat> and this chart shows uh, four categories, uh, strong and weak nucleophiles. And those same substances can be either strong or weak bases. And if you look at the bottom half of this page, it kind of shows what the distinction is between something behaving as a nucleophile <clears throat> versus something behaving as a base. In both cases, a nucleophile and a base have a pair of electrons to make a new covalent bond with, but a nucleophile makes that bond to carbon. In a base, those electrons are making a new bond to hydrogen. And when you take a hydrogen uh, away from an organic compound, uh, it ends up making an alkene. So with bases, they are a good way to turn alkanes into alkenes if that's your desire. But generally, we don't want both of these reactions happening. We want something either to behave as a nucleophile and undergo substitution, or in other cases, we may prefer it to behave as a base. Luckily, we can vary the reaction conditions to make one or the other of these more likely. So if I come back up to the chart here, you can see we've got uh, some things that are listed as both strong nucleophiles and strong bases. And so these substances like hydroxide, methoxide, uh, we have to be careful when we're using those uh, either as a nucleophile or a base. We have to be careful that we are getting the kind of reaction we expect. And this one called acetylide, we're going to see that in chapter 9. That is all about carbon-carbon triple bonds. And so, as it says, these are strong nucleophiles. They undergo substitution, but we also have to be careful that they don't undergo uh, elimination reactions. And in this footnote that's at the bottom of this chart, it's really tiny here, but it's important. Uh, it's this little footnote here that says <clears throat> that the strong nucleophiles that are also strong bases, they only behave as bases when the alkyl halide is secondary or tertiary. If you use them in conjunction with an alkyl halide that's primary or a methyl halide, then they function as nucleophiles. So we have to be careful when those are used so that we don't put them with an alkyl halide that it's incompatible with. Right next door to those strong base, strong nucleophiles are these strong bases that are weak nucleophiles, meaning things like amide and tertiary butoxide. They are good at pulling hydrogens away and turning alkanes into alkenes, uh, and they don't really have much of a desire to behave as nucleophiles. So when we want things to behave exclusively as a base, those are good choices. In this chapter, we've seen a lot of uh, examples with things like iodide, bromide, these things that are good, strong nucleophiles, but there are also weak bases. So there aren't really any limitations on the type of alkyl halide that we would be using. They pretty much always undergo substitution and never behave as, as bases. Uh, Finally, this last category, water and alcohols, we use those as solvents for reactions not only because they're good at dissolving things, but because they don't tend to behave very strongly as either bases or nucleophiles. They're weak in both of those regards. And normally we like the solvent just to be behaving in that, that one capacity, not to be getting in on the reaction. So there are uh, a couple of problems on the other worksheets that refer to this worksheet because they uh, Im imply that you are using either a strong base that's also a strong nucleophile and you have to determine in which capacity it's going to behave or if you're using again something that's a strong nucleophile and a weak base those are very preferable for the kind of reactions we're talking about in chapter 8. It's in other chapters where we will be wanting things to be acting like bases, and we'll see things like amides show up in chapter 9, and then also this tertiary butoxide. That tertiary butoxide looks a lot like things like methoxide, 
but because that T-butyl group is so big, it, that's what really prevents that from being a nucleophile. It's a little bit too bulky. Uh, Amid just naturally has properties that makes it very good at pulling away hydrogens and less likely to make bonds to carbon. Anyway, um, this is a good reference to have handy as you're doing those worksheets so that you'll know the circumstances under which nucleophiles uh, are more likely to do substitutions as opposed to instead revealing their base character.